Hi, good evening, and thank you for watching. My name is Michelle Kalk, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor for this event. As the state's voter education agency, clean elections host debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter the most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested primary election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. The questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state soliciting questions for the candidates. Voters that are watching this debate live, you can submit a question at any time by email debates at kc-a.com by text at 928-362-1062 or by phone at 480-937-1297. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. Tonight's Q&A is scheduled for 30 minutes. So we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. The candidates will have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. I may limit responses for time management purposes and we remind the candidates and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so our electorate may vote informed. Tonight's participant is Ryan Starzik, a Democrat running for the Arizona State House of Representatives and Legislative District 24. Ryan, you may begin with your opening remarks. I really appreciate that. And I'm actually running for State Senate and Legislative Senate, District. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I really appreciate the introduction and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this uh, live stream with me this evening. Now, my name is Ryan Starzik and I am running for State Senate and Legislative District 24 because I believe we can do so much better, bring up a progressive vision and drive this state to the future with new technology, with new innovation, with new education and instruction. And as somebody who has been here since 2012, I have seen Arizona transform in some of the most remarkable ways. We have done so many amazing things from bringing in new businesses to building up our communities. And then the pandemic hit and we had to switch our way of life rather rapidly. As somebody who served in the military, I know how to adjust to a, a different way of life as we have seen over the last several months. And I talk to thousands of people who are still struggling and we do not have a voice in the state Senate that is listening to the struggles we are going through right now. I, am, I jumped into this because I believe in the people of my community. I am motivated by the fact that I serve as the vice president of Phoenix Pride Board of Directors. And I am here to serve the community and fight for all of us to make the changes that we know all we all know are possible. Thank you. At this time, I will ask the candidate to respond to voters. And I apologize, folks. As a reminder, Ryan is a Democrat running for state Senate in Legislative District 24. So Ryan, the first question that was received, Mr. Starzik, I am very concerned about people with mental health issues and their ability to access the care they need. Can you tell us what policies the city and state should enact to address mental health issues. How will you fund that? Please be specific. Thank you so much for asking that very important question. Mental health is a very near and dear to my heart issue because I too struggled with mental health issues after getting out of the military. And that's why I made it a top three on my platform because I know for a fact that we can make it happen so every single person in the state of Arizona and especially in our communities can access mental health services. That is the direction we need to go. We need to make mental health exactly treated exactly the same as primary care. Primary care is covered under your insurance and mental health needs to be equally covered as well, regardless of ability to pay. The policy, from a policy standpoint, we need to enact legislation that says every single person in the state will have access to mental health services, provide grant funding to local nonprofit organizations to be able to do community outreach, and to be able to reach those folks, and also ensure that every single police department has a mental health professional 
on staff at all times to help and assist with diffusing situations since our police are not mental health professionals. We need to make sure we are putting mental health professionals in place to be able to support and help them. I know we can fund this because we are already funding $18 billion in tax credits and incentives every year. We need to start pulling back on some of those tax credits and incentives and put it into the things that matter. We all agree mental health is something that matters. It's something that can really transform Arizona, give you somebody to talk to confidently and in confidentiality. And that is what my plan will be to move us forward into the next century with Arizona and mental health. Thank you. The next question, and again, from a voter, I am a constituent of LD24 and support gun violence prevention. My question for Mr. Starzik is, how would you address gun violence in a legislature controlled by a Republican majority that hasn't already been tried by Representatives Longden and Hernandez? Gun control is a very difficult issue to be able to address. Gun violence also. One thing Republicans and Democrats do agree on is background checks. That is a starting point where we can begin to build up the need to be able to eventually ban assault weapons. Background checks on every single gun purchase, whether it's private, whether it's at a gun show, need to be instituted to make sure people who don't, shouldn't have guns in their hands are not getting them. There are red flag laws that could also potentially assist with this process. Some of those red flag laws have questionable components in them, but if there's a, temp if there's a need or a requirement to temporarily de de-arm somebody just until they can get through the legal process to make sure they are not a threat to themselves or others, that makes sense. And it's something Governor Ducey has supported as well, and it's something I stand behind. Mental health, it comes right back to mental health. When somebody is on the brink or when somebody is thinking about causing some sort of gun violence, it really starts with that mental health component. If we can get everybody covered with mental health services, we can likely reduce the amount of gun violence in our district and in our state. But it's going to take a lot of deep relationship building, putting pressure on elected officials. I am but one of soon to be 89 people in the ledge. We have got to work together from all sides. We have got to get pressure put on the elected officials that are there. And we have got to take a stand and start with background checks. That is something that we all collectively agree is very important. We start there, background checks, mental health, and we can significantly reduce the amount of gun violence. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Starzik, to address systemic racism, how should we analyze current and past legislation to determine if they are used to promote racist outcomes? Current and past legislation to see if they're used to promote racist outcomes? Yes. There, for every piece of legislation that is put forth, there needs to be an analysis conducted on it to see the impact on society, specifically on marginalized and minority groups in society before that legislation is allowed to be put forward. And if there is a disproportionate impact on minority groups or people of color or marginalized communities, that legislation, there needs to be a mechanism put in place legally that says that legislation cannot go forward. And that is one way we can curb the overzealous uh, prison populations that we currently have right now, which do disproportionately impact people of color and minority groups. Uh, the, the prison system right now, over $54 million last year in overtime alone. That $54 million, which there was no checks and balances on it in overtime by my opponent. My opponent did not mention anything about that overtime. We could have reallocated that to good, definitely to good mental health services, to supporting our communities and to reducing the prison population. Things that we need to do, we need to do, a we need to do an impact assessment on each and every single piece of legislation that is put forth, and we need to do an impact assessment on every piece of legislation that has already been put forth. Thank you. As a reminder to voters watching this debate live, you can submit a question at any time by email debates at kc-a.com by text 928-362-1062 or by phone 480-937-1297.
Ryan, the next question. There was a recent article in the Arizona Republic about a study that showed the impact of global warming on the Colorado River. Can you give specific examples of water policy initiatives at the city and state level that you would support to help conserve water? Thank you so much for asking that very important question. And our water rights here in Arizona and the conservation of water is such a very important issue for the long-term uh, sustainability of our state and our country, frankly. And what we need to start looking at right now is putting in place very strict mechanisms on, on con water conservation, reducing the amount of water output that is currently being wasted. We waste so much water each and every year from excess water in the grass. Well, come up with technologies that can replace it with AstroTurf-like grass to the sinks and faucets, to the amount that we could actually be saving from that with new and innovative technologies. We need to invest in research and development that can tell us the most promising technologies to help us save water and make sure that we are in a good long-term projection to be able to ensure that we have enough water for the future. Now, to assist in promoting that development, we need investments. We have to make investments. And we need elected officials out there that are willing to protect the water supply and promote sustainable development without curbing it too much, but also while making sure that we are protecting our water rights. It'll take compromise, it will take investments into technology and research, and it will take a lot of tough decisions as to what type of regulatory frameworks we put up to protect our water future. The next question, please explain in detail your methods for getting legislation passed. Relationship building. Re really, really going out there and taking the time, listening to what is important to the other side, to other people on my party, to the voters, finding what is important to my voters, talking with them, seeing what's important for them, making sure that I invest that time into building those relationships, do conducting and pulling research and assessments from a number of different sources to justify the positive impact for my community. Anything that does not have, uh, anything that does not have substantial research associated with it uh, to be able to put legislation forth should not be, have legislation put forth. I do not believe that the both sides can't work together. I believe firmly that both sides can work together. And we need to get away from the partisanship that currently dominates our state capital and start building relationships with people that want to look towards the future. I will always stand with organizations, with individuals, and with anybody that wants to look towards the future with me. My voters want that. The people of LD24 and the state want that. We all want future forward-looking opportunities and innovations to be able to take us to the next level. It's just going to take time effort, and as somebody who served as the Vice President of Phoenix Pride Board of Directors and have been in leadership positions with the military as well, I, I've proven I can build relationships with people from all walks of life, from all political ideologies, and I'm very comfortable being able to do that on behalf of the voters of my district. So thank you for that question. Great. The next question from one of the voters is, Mr. Starzik has said in his campaign materials that anyone who did not serve in the military shouldn't have the right to hold elected office. In the U.S., an estimated 7% of people have served in the military, while 23% are under 18 and ineligible for either military or office. Could you please explain why you think the remaining 70% of Americans are unworthy of the rights to hold elected office as explicitly guaranteed to them in the U.S. and Arizona constitutions? I appreciate the follow-up on that uh, statement that I had made. And no, that's not clear. That's actually inaccurate what I said. I said and suggested that people should have served in the military before they served elected office. I didn't say that they must. I only suggested that they should have. When you, when you look at military and, and the structure that it's able to build, I know for me personally, the military built a very solid structure where I was always looking at the best interest of my community. I wasn't looking at the best interest of my donors, unlike my opponent, who takes money from a lot of large corporations, does not have our interests in mind. So as somebody who served in the military, as knowing other elected officials who have served in the military, there's a drive, a determination, and a willingness to only focus on the mission. The mission is serving the people that you are representing. I'm not saying that 
nobody uh, that everybody only people serving in the military should hold elected office. I suggested that maybe only people that I said maybe only people that served in the military should consider holding elected office. So I, I hopefully that clarifies the point. But the previous statement that was made or the assertion that was made was not completely accurate. And I hope that brings up clarity to that point I had made. Okay, and moving along, a reminder again, uh, we do have questions that keep coming in. So I just wanna remind folks, if you're watching this debate live, you can submit a question. Email debates at kc-a.com. You can text 928-362-1062 or by phone at 480-937-1297. The next question, can Mr. Star, excuse me, can Mr. Starzik describe one specific bill from the previous or current session in which he thought the incumbent effectively, or I'm sorry, ineffectively worked with Republicans, how she was ineffective, what exactly he would have done differently, how would that have led to different results in the bill, and how that would have benefited LD24? I thank you so much for asking that very important question. I really do appreciate it. There's actually two examples I'll give you. One was this past session, there was SB 1306, which is a bill that would allow creditors more time to be able to sue people past the current statutory limitations, which is six years. With the current issues we face and so many people struggling to put food on the table, that bill that she voted in favor of is going to severely hurt my community. People in, in, in support of the bill to extend the timeline include the Arizona Creditors Bar Association and the Arizona Collectors Association. Then we look at Senator Alston's donors, which include Bank of America, APS, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Farmers Insurance, Wells Fargo, just to name a few. And it, it makes me wonder who would really benefit from that bill. It certainly isn't the voters of my district. What I, what I would have done differently, I would have voted against it. Yes, maybe I would have been the only one to do so. I would have voted against it because it hurts the people of my district. So it hurts the voters in this district. In fact, I would have voted against it and I would have lowered the time frame from six years down to four years, especially in the current circumstances that we are dealing with. The second bill is HB 2216, which is a bill that would essentially criminalize gay men for having sex. The language in that bill to include sodomy, the you know, just the gender identity of he, that 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 bill was heartbreaking. It's still heartbreaking that she would actually put it forward, she essentially wants to force me to get a class six felony and invade my privacy. And she put that bill out in 2013. And that to me goes to show you just what kind of a fake ally she actually is to the LGBTQ community. I've been there. I've been through it. I've been through the bullying. I've gone through so many different things. I have seen the things that happen to my community. She all of a sudden, because a gay man is running against her, decides that she wants to become a sudden ally. To me, that goes to show you the character of person that we're dealing with on the other side of this election. Uh, moving on to the next question, how do you plan on supporting medical staff, teachers, and those who are working to keep our community's health and safety if the quarantine or with the spike in COVID lately continues longer than initially expected? We will continue doing everything that we possibly can. I know the relief bill sent from the state house was well, from the state ledge was actually very small. It was only $55 million when in fact it should have been more like $500 million. That would have been a serious proposal to show everybody in the state that we are serious about taking care of each other. Now the federal government's influx of money that has come in to help people that are unemployed and to help fund more medical staff, I, I really hope that continues. But if it doesn't, the state elected officials have got to get serious about allocating considerable resources to making sure we are taking care of every single person in the state. And I will always be willing to put all politics aside, to put all partisanship aside, to sit down and say, okay, we have got to get this done. People are out there struggling, people are dying. Put everything aside, make sure that we are taking good care of our heroes our medical professionals are our heroes right now and providing them with the necessary resources to be successful and continue saving lives. Going on to education, how do you plan on supporting students who are losing opportunities to gain industrial experience, greater financial stability and so forth due to COVID? For example, K-12 
K through 12 and college students who are unable to obtain or use all of the resources they need to succeed academically and in their future. Thank you so much for asking that very important question. I really do appreciate it. Education in the state of Arizona has taken a back seat for far too long. The current initiative with Red for Ed that is being passed a ballot initiative, I want to encourage everybody to find a location and go sign that ballot petition because that is a serious bill or that is a serious ballot petition that will help the future of our education system. Now, from a practical standpoint, how do we build up skills? That's exactly the problem right now. The education system is focused on testing, standardized testing, and not enough on skills development of our students. We need to transform our education system. As I have said in my education policy plan, we need to transform it from where it is to the next generation of where it needs to be. The only way we can do that is by creating applied programs, not test-based programs, that teach our youth how to do things. Maybe not everybody wants to go to college, and that's okay. That's perfectly fine. But we need to set the framework for them in high school so that they are able to get a technical degree, so that they are able to be able to focus on a different trade, because those trades are important. And we have so many amazing and wonderful unions here in the state that could take them on to be able to help groom them from journeymen all the way up to senior executive experienced members. That's what we need to focus on, skills development, building up our next generation so that they are not only just focused on testing constantly. And what we need to really look at right now is from the COVID-19 has been so difficult in being able to achieve those things. We have to keep our students safe. We have to keep our students safe in any way possible. There has to be flexibility with the school districts. We have to provide that flexibility so that they can have online classes or at least split them up 50-50, part of them online one day and then part of them in the classroom the next day. We have to, from a legislative standpoint, we have to provide the flexibility to the school districts to be able to make that happen. What is your plan to support potentially undocumented workers and families, agriculture workers and other workers who don't or may not have the privileges of benefiting from worker benefits and health insurance or of practicing social distancing? What would I do for the... So right now with the COVID relief, um, maybe there are folks who are undocumented workers and their families who are unable to benefit from the state benefits or the federal benefits, and then also who are continuing to work and may not be able to practice social distancing. That, that's a very difficult situation to be in. And I know my partner, when he came, immigrated to, from Colombia to the United States, him and his family, and they were, in a, they were in a situation where they weren't citizens yet. They had to go through a very elongated and difficult process, just as anybody coming from another country and coming to this country currently has to. Now, we, we are a country of immigrants. We have got to show compassion and appreciation for the things that our value-added members of society are currently doing. And we have got to provide them with some resources to be able to make sure that they are not risking spreading the disease to other people in our population or among themselves. The jobs that they do are so hard, but they are so necessary from an agricultural standpoint. Yes, we, we from a compassion and a humanistic standpoint, we need to pr try and help those folks because they are doing just as much for us as we, as we could possibly expect. And we need to try to find ways, find resources to make sure we are at least showing them the kind of compassion that this country is built upon. The next question from a voter, Mr. Starzik, you repeatedly criticize our current senator on many subjects, then refuse to elaborate when asked. Now you have been heard stating that our senator doesn't get enough bills passed while making no mention of the current Senate Republican majority. Please explain in great detail um, your methods of working with the Republican majority. I thank you for asking that, and I do criticize anybody that can't get enough bills passed. I, I know that it's pretty clear from what we've seen that there isn't a desire to build up those relationships anymore because otherwise things would be able to be more successful. My, my method of doing anything is to bring substantial research to the table to make sure you're building a coalition with business groups and 
with the community and providing all the additional insights as to the benefits for everybody equally. Uh, yes, I, I would absolutely take the time to invest the time to build up those relationships, to focus on the things that I can get past instead of always just putting forth hundreds of you know very partisan bills just for show and tell. And it's unfortunate that my opponent hasn't been able to get anything done of substance over the last 40 years. And this is where we are. Our education system is ranked nearly last. Uh, the district is struggling with explosive housing costs. And we have a weak state senator who is not paying attention to the things that our constituents need. And I am listening. I am hearing them. And I am going to fight for each and every person, even you, even though you seem to think that I'm criticizing her, I'm calling out elected officials just like they should be. Every elected official needs to be held to the highest standard of accountability. I would expect nothing less, and you shouldn't expect anything less either. So thank you. And I will give another reminder about um, if you're watching the debate live where you can submit your questions to. You can send them by email to debates at kc-a.com by text 928-362-1062 or by phone 480-937-1290. Uh, another question that's come in, I understand you you are a clean elections candidate. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? For example, how many contributions do you need? What is the amount of clean funding you will receive? Thank you. See, I, that's the kind of question I'm really excited to answer because clean elections, it means I'm focused on voters, not donors. Okay, so here's the reason why I ran as a clean elections candidate, and I'll tell you a little bit about the process associated with it. I'm running as a clean elections candidate because I wanted to focus on spending time with my voters and not sitting on the phone, constantly having to raise money to do mailers and to do anything else that you would need money for. So the way it works is I sign up as a clean elections candidate, okay? I go through the process of orientation. Then I have to start collecting what are called qualifying contributions, $5 qualifying contributions. And in order to qualify for the clean elections funding, you have to get a minimum of $205 clean election qualifying contributions, either online, which is very much preferred because it's much more seamless, or you can get them through a, a paper, a paper form. And the money comes from uh, a 10% surcharge on criminal and civil penalties. There is no tax money being used to fund clean elections candidates like myself. And I'm so excited because I did just qualify for clean elections funding, which is very exciting, especially uh, given how hard it was. And it is, it is a struggle. And I find a lot of people do not understand the clean election system. And it's unfortunate because it's an amazing system that can encourage so many people to participate. I expect to get somewhere around $45,000 between the primary and the general election. And all I have to do is focus on the voters. I don't have to go to somebody's door, make the phone calls to say I need money. I can just call and say, hey, what are the things that you care about? That is the reason I ran clean because I wanna hear your needs, what you feel, what you're thinking. I don't wanna have to keep asking people for money because I feel like the connection could be lost. So that's clean elections and that's the reason I decided to run. Elections are obviously in the news as of late, and especially the idea of voter safety at the polls and the issue of mail-in ballot versus going to the poll. Here in Arizona, we have the permanent early voting list, and people who are registered to vote can actually request a mail-in ballot. After what happened in Georgia last night, what are your thoughts on ways that Arizona can ensure we're doing enough to uh, provide education outreach to voters for mail-in ballots? Thank you. So the very simple thing that Arizona legislature could do to try to save lives, protect people, and work in the best interest of our residents here is to just do automatic voter mail-in ballots for every single registered voter in the state. That is the best, safest, and most logical way that everybody agrees with would save money, would save the potential for exposure and risk, and would also increase voter participation. And that's exactly the problem the Republicans have. It would increase voter participation. Now, that is one argument that they continue to make because they know they will end up losing control of both chambers. 
So what we need to do is encourage every single person that you know, encourage them to sign up for the Pebble, the permanent early voter list. Every time I talk to somebody on the phone or I see them in the street or I, I go and knock on their door, the first thing I, one of the first things I ask is, you're signed up for the Pebble, right? If they don't know what that is, I talk them through it. I go through the steps it takes to be able to sign up for it. I put it on my social media account every so often. So if you need to know what the steps are, there's also a Medium article I put out there. The Pebble is the best way for us to protect ourselves since it's pretty clear the Arizona ledge right now will not legislatively enact the ability for every single registered voter to get a, a mail-in ballot. You have to take the initiative to go online and to be able to do it, set it up, and make sure everybody you know around you has also done it. And somewhat similarly, in terms, and you mentioned this earlier about the Vote for Ed um, initiative, or Red for Ed initiative, and, and talking to folks about signing. Should voters be able to sign ballot measures electronically through eQual, similarly um, as they can for statewide candidates? I, I thank you for that. And I, I'm surprised we haven't already set that up. It, it's, it just seems like it makes no sense. The equal systems, number one, it saves a lot of people uh, from everywhere in every agency so much, uh, so much verification process and a lot of different complex paperwork process. Yes, yes, we are so behind on this. And it goes back to my feeling on technology. This is something that's important. We have got to advance from a technology standpoint. I know my opponent has said multiple times that she's a low technology person. And if we expect to advance with technologies like this to be able to make sure equals for ballot initiatives are there, then you need to vote for somebody that actually believes, understands, and is willing to take the lead to fight for it from a technology standpoint. I am that candidate, and I hope you vote for me on August 4th. Another question is in regard to the last several sessions at the legislature, there has been news and reports of relationships between legislators and lobbyists. You mentioned earlier um, the ethics and responsibility that legislators hold. Do you believe the legislature should adopt an ethics and rules governing um, I'm sorry, ethics and rules governing personal relationships with lobbyists? Yes, I do. And I, I see no reason. I'm actually surprised that there probably isn't stricter ones there right now. It, it's long overdue. It's a no-brainer. The voters expect it. There's already ways to circumvent it, the relationship with lobbyists by PAC money and corporate contributions, such as the ones that my opponent takes, uh, because then they can give her money and such as from APS has given her thousands of dollars. And you don't hear those voices from those elected officials screaming out that there's uh, about the rate increases that constantly happen. Well, that rate increase was come that the money they used from that rate increase, our, our state senator got a part of that revenue. So just to keep that in mind. Now, yes, we need strict guidelines. Absolutely. We need, I mean, a class two felony because the trust of the voters, voters should never have to second guess who is representing them, that they're going to have a more, uh, they're going to be more personally involved with a lobbyist than they are with their constituents. They should never have to even think about that for one second. I firmly believe that we should absolutely look at, is this integrity? No, this is not integrity when we have the lobbyists and Arizona legislators uh, being so cozy with each other. This is not integrity working for you. By no means is it. It's integrity working against you. Another question and tying it into something you mentioned earlier about state incentives. For economic development and incentives offered to companies who are either expanding or locating to Arizona, what else can the state do to attract more jobs and new industries, if not through incentives? Creating the environment that there is skilled workforce, I would say we definitely have to work on workforce development to be able to attract the high technology jobs that we really want to attract here. And that is really one of the key components is do we have the skilled workforce? We can have all the incentives we want, but if we don't have, don't have the people to do them, then the incentives aren't going to mean much. Making sure we have a very well-trained, very well-developed workforce is of vital importance. And we need to invest into our workforce so that companies are willing to come here, so that they find Arizona as attractive as we all do. Arizona is an amazing place. But we have to make sure we have the people here that can do the important jobs of the future to keep us going, to keep us successful, and to keep us driving into the next generation. 
This week, the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, or JLBC, issued uh, the most recent revenue report for Arizona, which a lot of folks were looking forward to seeing um, if there were any dips from last year revenue over revenue. And we noticed that the, the rates or the tax revenue that came in was not as uh, much lower as was anticipated, but something that stood out was that 56% of the state's revenue comes from sales tax. So as the legislature and looking at the tax and revenue options, are we doing enough to diversify our tax base? No, we're not, and we haven't been for a very long time. The corporate tax rate is entirely too low. Every single corporation in the state to operate in the state needs to pay their fair share. And if people say it's a tax increase, well, it's not, it's not a tax increase. It's you contributing and us making sure we have the right schools, to make sure we have the right roadways, to make sure we have the right uh, technology infrastructure to be able to help sustain those very companies that are here. And I know that there's probably a, an assumption right now about how much or how little the budget shortfall is going to be. And if, if we need to take a temporary budget shortfall, we need to go into a little debt for a couple of years to help balance things out. I want to make sure that we're not cutting the wrong thing. So because education usually is the first thing on the chopping block. And we look back in 2008 when education was cut, we still haven't even reached that level with our education system. We still haven't even gotten close to that level. So I do not want to see education. I will fight hand, tooth, and nail to make sure education, social services, and health care in this state are not cut. Those are three red lines. When we have $18 billion in tax credits and incentives going to companies that benefit my opponent's campaign fund, I will stand firm on saying we are not going to cut anything until we start reeling back on these tax credits and incentives. So yeah, we need to diversify the state revenues, but we should, probably should start with some of the excess tax incentives and revenue and credits that are being given out that don't provide us any quantifiable returns. And speaking of education, and you tied it in earlier when you talked about what returning to school looks like for students, and you suggested maybe a 50% online, 50% in person, would you support legislation that would limit class sizes for K-12 schools? I think that is so important. Yes, I for sure. In fact, I would support legislation that would limit class sizes and require a teacher assistant in every single classroom. It, you know, students have different learning styles. Like whenever I was growing up, I, I never did well on tests. I, that, that's not indicative of my ability to do things. I just, I just didn't do good on tests. And I know I'm not alone out there. There's other students that don't do well with other areas. There's other applied learning techniques that we need to make sure there's the right support structures available and present to help them be able to manage those things. And so personally, if there's a classroom full of 20 students, you have to have a teacher assistant. And I do not believe any classroom should ever be above 20 students because that right there is already, you're managing 20 personalities. You're managing 20 unique and different learning styles. Would I like to see it lower? Yes, but I think starting at 20 and working to get it lower with a teacher assistant will be a great opportunity for Arizona to continue growing and developing our future generation and workforce. When you mentioned talent as uh, a factor for attracting businesses to Arizona, we have three state universities here in Arizona. Do you believe that our universities are affordable for students entering college? No, I do not. The university system has become entirely too excessive in how much it charges students. We need to reel back universities and state residents, uh, it shouldn't be a profit, it, sh it really shouldn't be a profit mill. And unfortunately, the university systems in Arizona have turned into profit mills. We have a very unchecked balance of power with the Board of Regents where they're able to raise tuition rates uh, without any real valid input from the ledge. We need to stop that. We need to put a stop to that. We need to cut the rates of it for uh, tuition and we need to cut back on the amount of land that these universities continue to purchase and all these huge massive buildings that they continue to develop at the expense of students. Uh, universities should be there to teach and train and develop the next generation, not as profit mills that are taking advantage of the federal student loan programs. So there's reforms needed there and I will firmly and strongly support those reforms because we need to focus on what is the investments that our students need to make to develop themselves for the jobs of the future, rather than being tied down and bogged down with excessive amounts of debt. 
In terms of, and you mentioned the prison system earlier, so in terms of that, what do you think can be done to reduce recidivism and tackle social or economic factors leading to recidivism? The first and foremost, what we really need to focus on is making sure that people do not go into prison to begin with. We need diversion programs. We need to make sure that there's mental health courts. We need to help give people the support they need to get back on the right track. Uh, instead of broken windows policing, which is minor things, just police going out there looking for the minor things to be able to just meet whatever quotas they may theoretically have. Of course, they'd never confirm or deny that. Now, we need to focus on making sure people don't go to prison to begin with. Everybody has that weak moment in life where they might make a mistake, where they do something that's nonviolent in nature, or they have an addiction problem. I've had an addiction problem many years ago. I know what that's like. I know how painful and how you struggle with it. And I was, I was very lucky to be able to overcome it with the structure from the Veterans Affairs. I had that structure. We need to provide that same structure to people that are going through something. Make sure we are not even having to deal with the recidivism, but in fact, we are providing different types of resources to help keep them on the right track and out of prison. Speaking of addiction, and one thing that a lot of folks are faced with here in Arizona and across the country is the opioid crisis. Is the state responding appropriately or what can they be doing to further the response? The state is not responding appropriately because there's not as strict requirements on the delivery of opioids from physicians as there really should be. Uh, the state tried to do some legislative maneuvering to make it look like they did something, but we need extremely strict requirements that go through multiple stages and multiple doctors before anybody is even allowed to have uh, a prescription for opioids. We're seeing it destroy families all over the state, all over the country. We're seeing addiction rates rising through the roof, and we're seeing pharmaceutical companies that benefit, you know, that contribute to my opponent also reaping the profits from it. And we have got to look at what's happening right now around the state and around the country. We've got to help uh, people get off of the op opioid issue, addiction that they currently have. And we have to do it by putting extremely strict protection measures in place to help them do so and recovery centers to help them get off of it as well. Uh, just a few minutes to go before we wrap up, but I um, wanted to ask what elected official, either historical or currently serving, do you most admire? Historical or currently serving? Okay. I would have to say that Senator Mendez, I really do admire. Senator Mendez, uh, Juan Mendez, he's currently serving. He's not afraid to get out there and speak his mind. He's not afraid to be who he is. He's not afraid to stand up against the powers that be and to really pour his heart out. I, I've always admired his approach. Uh, people say it's very radical. I say it's very democratic. He's very strong in his convictions. He's always willing to speak truth to power. And that is somebody who I really have admired over the years and have followed closely, who is I, somebody I look up to. Well, now uh, we haven't had any other questions come in, so you can give your closing statement. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I started this adventure back in early 2018. I really looked into myself. I, I talked to my friends. I talked to my family. I talked to my mentor. And I said, what's going on? What, what are we doing? What is, what is going on here? I got so tired of screaming at a television that I decided to stand up and do something about it, because that's the beauty of our democratic process. That's the beauty of this country, of this state, that if you want to make change somewhere, you get up and do it. You break down the barriers of the status quo, you beat back the establishment that gets in your way, and you fight for it. And that's what I've been doing ever since I launched this campaign, fighting for each and every single person in this district, because that is what I believe I must do as a veteran. That's what I see as the mission, and that's the only thing I see as important is to serve the people of Legislative District 24. I am not a perfect human being, but I will always own up to my mistakes, and I am always willing to be honest to the things I have done. I was warned by so many people in powerful positions around the state not to run. How dare you run against my opponent? You shouldn't be doing this. And every single time somebody said that to me, it would motivate me 10 times more because I realized 
they were the ones that were scared. The voters don't even know who she is. That's what I've learned after talking to thousands of people and talking to engaging for the last year and a half. I, I am here to support and to help our community. That's what I'm here for. And as a military veteran, that's what I believe in. I'm here for the people. And I'm running as a clean elections candidate, so you know where I'm focused on. So thank you so much for listening in, for giving me this unique opportunity, and I hope that I can count on your vote on August 4th for State Senate and Legislative District 24. Thank you, Ryan. This concludes our debate. And to the candidate, Ryan Starzik, we thank you so much for participating. To the voters, we thank all of you who took the time to watch the debate and inform yourselves ahead of the August 4 primary election. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is your source for nonpartisan voter information. We encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for all of your voting needs. Thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Have a good night.